is no way it shows for one the government can't sell it. Today, just one corrupt union, they say. Why I can't trust Julia Gillard. The Prime Minister's disability scheme. Where's the $8 billion to pay for it? 600 more boat people in just one week. And making Hugh Jackman's joke disappear. She really is very handy with the sword. I'm Andrew Bolt and this is The Bolt Report. A reporter to the Health Services Union's East Branch this week accused union officials of misusing an astonishing $20 million. And that's the money of hospital cleaners, orderlies, kitchen hands. And this report by Ian Temby QC alleged union president Michael Williamson channeled contracts worth nearly $5 million to a company he part owns. Paid his wife hundreds of thousands for archiving. Spent one and a half million dollars on a building his son used for a music studio. Pocketed a huge salary and issued padded contracts without tenders. Williamson, who denies wrongdoing, was not long ago Labor's national president. And he helped get his protege into parliament. The union has never, never written to me, never commenced an action, never said, Mr Thompson, you owe us money. Yes, Craig Thompson, who Fair Work Australia found misappropriated $400,000 of health services union money himself who was protected by Prime Minister Julia Gillard, who was given $350,000 by Labor for legal expenses. But now Labor says, relax, this is just one bad union. The overwhelming bulk of people who work in trade unions representing their fellow workers are decent people doing a great and professional job. The very uh, sad and, and, and sordid saga we're seeing unfold, I do not believe that is representative of the trade union movement, the labour movement at large. Really? In fact, Gillard and Shorten both know of one other union scandal that was covered up. It's the scandal Labor's Robert McClellan, a cabinet minister until Gillard sacked him, last month said made him want tougher laws against corrupt union bosses. I know the Prime Minister is quite familiar with this area of the law uh, as lawyers in the mid-1990s were involved in a matter representing opposing clients. Gillard in the mid-1990s was a partner in law firm Slater and Gordon when her client and then boyfriend, union official Bruce Wilson, misappropriated $400,000 from the Australian Workers' Union, later led by Bill Shorten. It's a powerful union, the AWU, whose president then and now is Bill Ludwig. Ludwig's union influences as many as 25 federal Labor MPs, and his support keeps Gillard in her job. I'm proud to be here and to call myself a friend of Bill Ludwig. But back then, the union somehow ran dead on this scandal. Charges weren't laid, the money wasn't repaid. What's more, Gillard has never explained precisely what help she gave, if any, in creating the questionable union association or accounts Wilson used, or in buying a house with the proceeds. Yes, she denies she knew anything of Wilson's wrongdoing, saying she was young and naive. But until Gillard and Shorten explain exactly what went on, I'll consider their assurances on union corruption worthless. Julia Gillard this week said she'd pay one billion dollars for a trial of her national disability insurance scheme, giving the, the disabled the same level of care whether they're insured or not. But premiers of the big states at first wouldn't add to the five billion a year they already spend on the disabled. What frustrates me is that of that billion dollars, only $350 million goes to actually providing services to people with disabilities. The rest is admin and setup costs. The, the rest is the necessary arrangements to uh, set up the scheme. 
Joining me is Opposition Finance Spokesman Andrew Robb. Andrew, we're uh, actually talking about two things here. One is this trial scheme that will cover just 20,000 people and cost $1 billion. Second is the full scheme, which will cost $8 billion a year. Should this trial start when no one's yet agreed on how to pay for the full scheme? These are one of many questions, I think, that are pertinent to this issue. Um, the fact of the matter is that from the outset, every Australian government and opposition, state and federal, endorsed what the Productivity Commission proposed. Right? So it takes a special skill for a Prime Minister to turn this into a political bun fight, given that level of endorsement. And yet, um, she seemed to vary from the Productivity Commission. The questions that need to be asked are, you know, is the Commonwealth, is this government still prepared to fund the gap between the $5 billion spent by the states and what the Productivity Commission said would be the ultimate cost? But that's the, we're talking, it said $8 billion a year extra. Where's the money coming from? We're going to be setting up a trial at a huge cost. No one yet knows if you can afford the full fandango. Well, well again, yeah, exactly right. Where's the money going to come from? Will it still start at 2018-19, as proposed by the Productivity Commission? Will the Commonwealth fill the gap? These are legitimate questions for any state government, given the mess there. Many of those have inherited from Labor. Will there be 3,000 public servants, as is already being mooted out of Canberra, to administer this, this whole exercise? So a trial that already hires 3,000 public servants when there's no surety that we can move to the full thing. It's, look, the, to me, we've got the Prime Minister sort of rushing to grab the glory for this thing before even the first sod is turned. And before we know what's in the mind of the Prime Minister and the government, they've changed the amount of money to be spent on the trials massively instead of $4 billion, $1 billion. Where's the money coming for any of that to start with? Well, do you think that any government can find that full $8 billion a year extra by 2018? Well, any government could, but it probably will, will require stopping or removing other programs. But do you think you could? If we stopped other programs, we could. But would, would, are you committing to finding that $8 billion a year by 2018? We, we have said that we support the Productivity Commission proposal. Yeah, but 2018. 2018. And you, the you, government... You can make it. You'll have that money by 2018. Well, the government said this as well, and then went into... But was that a yes? Bully... I'm just trying to check. Was that a yes, that you would have that money by 2018? We... we we will introduce that program according to the Productivity Commission proposal, which means, which means that we will allocate resources to this project to enable it to start in full by 2018. Because Joe Hockey said he couldn't commit to it. The Shadow Treasurer said he couldn't commit to we, it. We, we can, and we have said that we do support the Productivity Commission proposal for the states to uh, support and cooperate with the federal government, questions such as the Commonwealth fund it, as the Productivity mm. Commission said it would, how will it be administered? But I'm just wondering, Joe Hockey said he couldn't fund it, he couldn't promise to it, it's a lot of money, and you say you can. Well, what I'm saying is that any government, our government, the federal government, can ensure that 2018-19 is a start date. It just means it's a question of priorities. It probably, as I said, uh, would require um, the removal or the scaling back of other programs mm. to make this a priority. And bear in mind, if government is to do, if government has got a legitimate role in spending taxpayers' money, it must first and foremost be to look after people who have got no capacity to look after themselves. Um, in fact, though, isn't it the case that the budget forecasts of further surplus, uh, future surpluses already, you know, thanks to the mining boom, are looking, already looking shot? And the budget forecasts growth in China, for example, of 8%, we now know it's 7.5%, uh, it, and it projected only a gradual decline from the record commodity prices. We now see Deloitte Access Economics saying the mining boom could be over as soon as two years. Um, are we, in fact, looking at a big budget black hole that make all sorts of talk about big spending programs useless? Uh, we have all along thought that the government has uh, taken the most optimistic forecasts. Um, again, the budget was predicated on 
everything going well around the world, um, that the mining boom and our terms of trade, our record terms of trade holding up. The fact is that you know, even the budget papers in indicated that for every 4% every change in the terms of trade, you're talking about $7 billion increase in the budget deficit. The terms of trade are currently about um, they're currently about 50% uh, higher than the average over the 80s and 90s. So the scope for any off. movement, you're seeing, you're seeing prices well, coming off far more than we off. thought. The other thing is that the BHP, Olympic Dam proposal, uh, that's in doubt. Shell announced yesterday $17 billion worth of projects that are in doubt. Half the pipeline that Swan brags about is in fact uh, has not reached FID or final investment decision and probably won't. It's a big worry. Look, we've got to go just quickly uh, before we go. I mentioned in my editorial the Bruce Wilson case involving the former boyfriend and client of uh, Julia Gillard. What's the biggest question you'd like to ask her about this scandal? There's a lot of questions that uh, have not been answered. It's all being brushed away. Uh, just first and foremost, did the Prime Minister, when she was acting as lawyer for the AWU, was she responsible for developing, for putting in place the AWU Welfare Reform Association? These are the sorts of questions that, that are at the heart of the problem. Okay. I think we need to ask her that. Uh, Andrew Robb, thanks for joining me. Uh, coming up, this is crazy. Unions want a loss-making oil refinery forced to stay open, so they pick a fight with Woolies? And my message to Woolworths is come and get us. Tony Abbott went to China this week and told the country he'd like it to be more democratic. And the opposition leader said he had a problem with investment here by companies controlled by the Chinese regime. It would rarely be in Australia's interest to allow a foreign government or its agencies to control an Australian business. That's because we don't support the nationalisation of business by the Australian government, let alone by a foreign one. Foreign Minister Bob Carr was outraged. He is striking in, in, in three or four of the things he said about China. What can only be seen, and which will, will be seen by them, I think, as an adversarial approach with China. And I think that is reckless. I, I, I think it is really dangerously dumb. Joining me are former Immigration Minister Amanda Vanstone and former New South Wales Health Minister John Delabosca. John, I'm a little bit puzzled uh, by Bob Carr's outrage. So what did Tony Abbott actually do that was wrong? I think it was pretty understated outrage um, by the Foreign Minister, so I don't think it was... Dangerously uh, dumb. That's dangerously dumb. It's, uh, I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think that's... What's understated? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we'd, we'd have to wait a while for Bob to wind up. But look, the bottom line on this is that... Uh, People do have to treat with uh, care when they're the opposition leader. I think it's legitimate for the opposition leader in Australia to make remarks about foreign policy. It's a little bit dangerous to go to China and, uh, and start making pronouncements about uh, foreign policy as the opposition leader. But what was um, the foreign policy thing that he said wrong? Uh, well, I'm about to get to that, Andrew. Uh, I actually personally think it's about time that people did start ringing the bell on the democracy issue in China. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, uh, I think that's quite appropriate for all the leadership of um, any of the Australian political parties. And it is a legitimate thing to say that China has benefited uh, from many of the aspects of the Western economy. And one of the things that the Western economy has thrived on um, most of the time in our history is democracy. So it sounds like you're, you're, you're agreeing with what Bob Carr says was dangerously dumb. Well, I think there's an inconsistency, though, also in the trade issue because there are lots and lots now, of look, governments that have, have, uh, have uh, interests in enterprises that invest in Australia and they're not all communist governments. Well, honestly, give me a break. Carr's Prime Minister, in her first overseas trip, I think it was, made the announcement she wasn't really interested in foreign affairs. She'd rather be sitting so, in, a in a classroom. Yeah, rather be sitting in a classroom. So, you know, are we being critical of an opposition leader who goes to China and states the obvious? Democracy is a good thing. Yes. And if you want to invest here, by the way, we have a foreign investment review board. And, uh, you know, we, we watch reasonably carefully what happens with our assets, as indeed do most other countries. No big deal. I mean, I don't think Bob Carr is in any position to be uh, nitpicking with what other people say. He's made, made his own... Uh, 
Um, well, you'd have to be right in worrying, wouldn't you, John, about state-owned enterprises by a government like China's, which is uh, not democratic, uh, and these uh, state-owned enterprises don't operate in normal market uh, rules, um, buying whole businesses in Australia. You'd have to have a bit of scrutiny well, on now that. I hide, now I hide myself behind Amanda's position. We do have a foreign investment <laughs> review board. Um, and, uh, and of course... Uh, I'm still you know, struggling with my point. With that. My, my point. With that. Well, I think I did say, I did say, I think it was about time people started putting their hand up when we relate to China about the issue of democracy and human rights. Um, and I don't think that's the problem. About time. The Howard I think the problem is the way in which... Human rights dialogue with, uh, I think, I think with that's China. The, the problem is the way it's done, and I think that was the only reservation I have. But I also say it's a little bit hypocritical to talk about the economic aspects because the government of Singapore, the government of Saudi Arabia, the government of a whole range of, of, uh, of uh, investors in Australia or potential investors in Australia have substantial interests or outright own enterprises that are investing yeah, in Australia. Well, look, if one of them goes south, I don't mind having a confrontation with the Singaporean government. If I have a confrontation with the Chinese government, that's, that's just suddenly a bigger, far bigger issue. But listen, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Tony Abbott met the Indonesian pr president recently. He then went to the US uh, leadership dialogue and meeting top people there. Uh, and now uh, in China, that's a deliberate strategy to broaden his image, is it not? Well, I would have thought it's a sensible thing to do. I mean, the, the polling indicates that He's going to be Australia's next Prime Minister. Mm. Uh, things can happen, I understand that. No, no one should guarantee anything in their head. Um, but you'd be a fool not to prepare yourself. And, and one way to prepare yourself is to expand into areas that you might not have spent a lot of time on in the past. So getting to know leaders in our region, leaders that are important to us, like our allies, the United States, China and uh, Indonesia, is a very important step. I, it's, I think it's, it's a good it's thing. It's little about uh, foreign affairs. It's really, it's been a foreign territory to them, almost literally. Um, but that, do you think it's going to work, this idea of uh, Abbott the statesman? Do you think people will buy that? Well, look, I think obviously <clears throat> look, the politics of this is I think pretty straightforward. Um, Tony Abbott's, on the basis of the polling, as Amanda said, is, is uh, you know probably uh, firm in the betting for to be the next Prime Minister of Australia. Um, but he does have some serious problems as an opposition leader. He has a net satisfaction rating which is you know close to a record low. Um, it is it is not without precedent that opposition leaders have mm. poor standings so you agree and then that become has got a serious problem do you because her her well, satisfaction I, I, ratings are around the same level so i, I think, I I've, I think i'm think on the record saying Gillard that there's a problem a that doesn't very serious problem <clears throat> but i'm not necessarily saying that any for either tony abbott or for julie Gillard, those this problem is necessarily fatal but staying with tony abbott for a second um this is obviously a strategy to broaden out his image, to um, get away from some of the domestic uh, negative, negativity, etc., that he's, he's he's fessed up to being characterised by. I, I think it's an interesting uh, change for him. Uh, job losses this week, uh, John. There were quite a few. The one probably that caught the main headlines was the uh, closing of the Kernel refinery. 300 jobs gone, uh, which is uh, very sad for the people involved. Uh, it's switching from. Uh, in make, in refining the oil itself to importing it from bigger refineries, more efficient ones in Asia. I was amazed by the AWU boss Paul Howes' reaction. Uh, very worrying for a state he wants uh, shoppers to tell Woolworths to, that its petrol outlet, which uses uh, Cal Caltex fuel, shouldn't use, should uh, not use foreign fuel instead. Ever listen to him? When you fill up in future at a Woolworths petrol bowser, you are not using the Australian fuel people, you are using the foreign fuel people. Now listen, uh, forcing Woolies to put pressure on Caltex to keep open a refinery that loses $200 million a year, this is crazy. What sort of union movement is this? Well, I don't know if he was saying that. I mean, I think he was That's making what I was a hearing. point of frustration about job losses and the reason why there's job losses. Um, obviously, he's got to advocate for members that have just lost their jobs. A that's, consumer boycott of Woolies. Uh, well, he didn't actually advocate a consumer boycott of Woolies, and I'm sure if he's going to do heard. that, right he's going to have to. He's going to have to kind of uh, get a little bit more uh, social media going and a whole lot of resources uh, to uh, to have any impact on Woolies. So um, uh, I don't think that's where the union is really going. I think it's uh, but, but uh, one yet, of those statements that's made. Uh, for the, on the stump, um, for the members, yeah, to, cheer to, up the to, members. to demonstrate what the problem is. But, but Amanda, this seems to fit into a sort of pattern. Now, Howe's also uh, called on the government to threaten uh, Chevron, which is a Caltex shareholder, suggesting, implying it should threaten its $43 billion Gorgon gas project to keep Kernel open. I mean, 
what's the strategy here? I mean, is he just doing it to well, appeal to members? Look, or? I, I think his strategy is, is publicity for himself with his members. Um, I, I think I can be forgiven for assuming that this guy thinks he belongs in federal parliament where Julia Gillard now is. That's what he thinks. But if he does want to go there, he's going to have to understand there isn't a business leader in Australia that says we need to be a more productive nation. We need productivity improvement. And until we do that, while we keep paying ourselves a lot and not making ourselves more productive, guess what? Investment's going to go somewhere else. It's just that simple. You've put your simple. finger on it. There's a tension here between the AW being a major power broker in federal politics and also just wanting to fight for its members. And I think this is what's being exposed here. John, um, on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, now you are now the campaign director of uh, Every Australian Counts, which is a lobby group advocating for the NDIS. Um, Julia Gillard, had, has, has she had a big win today? I mean, she, oh, this week, convincing New South Wales and Victoria, despite their initial opposition, <coughs> to chip, chip in some money for this trial? Well, the most important thing for me as campaign director of Every Australian Counts is that people with, people with a disability, Australians with a disability had a big win and Australia had a big win because we make uh, the first steps towards really addressing the huge deficit in the way in which disability, Australians with a disability is supported um, uh, at, at the moment and for the last two generations or so. So that's the first thing. That's the people who've had the win by making sure this is better done. It was a bit unseemly that we had a lot of hectoring and a lot of uh, uh, bickering between the Premiers and the, and, the, and the Prime Minister and the Commonwealth and the States. But then again, um, the politician in me, well, I'm not really a politician anymore, but having a firm memory of Ministerial Council's past and COAG's past, uh, Nothing new in that. Uh, 111 years, the Commonwealth and the States have been bickering about money. And boy, did she uh, would she gain from a win. But Amanda, the thing that worried me was two thirds of that one billion dollars just for the trial is in administration. Uh, that is an mm, that, amazing look, it is amount. It is a serious worry. I used to be the disability minister once, and I do think that the states always try. I'm sure they do. I don't think I know. They always try and get the Commonwealth to pay more, and that's a bit unattractive. Equally unattractive, I would have thought on this sort of issue. Uh, is the Prime Minister not trying in the very beginning to get a bipartisan approach? And there's a little bit of card playing here, look at me, you know, I care for the, the uh, more disadvantaged people in the community, with the implication that others don't. I think that's unattractive. But look, in any government spending, what you have to look at is admin. Uh, what's going on public servants? You need public servants. They can do a really good job. But you've got to get the balance right, and that's a hell of a lot of money it on administration. Sure Put is. it another way, how much is actually going into disability services? Uh, uh, that's what will make the difference. 350 million. Amanda Vance and John Delabosca, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Coming thanks, up, Andrew. it's thank you. magic. Julia Gillard makes Hugh Jackman disappear. Our boat people policy has collapsed. This week, another nine boats turned up, bringing 615 people, twice as many in just one week than turned up in the last six years of the Howard government. But it was the one that didn't make it that shows asylum seekers now treat this government as a taxi service. On Wednesday, 70 people on a boat northwest of Bali sent out a distress call and explained their problem to ABC reporter George Roberts. Okay, please, fast, because this ship is not going to be, you know, stay out more than one hour. But when Roberts alerted Indonesia, they weren't happy. You tell for uh, Indonesian? Yes, I told Indonesian Why? search and rescue. I come to Australia. Australia is not coordinating the rescue, so... No, no, no. Good news, Indonesia's navy brought these people back to Indonesia. But wait... Why won't our Navy do the same? Actor Hugh Jackman tried to help Julia Gillard on the set of the latest Wolverine movie. I don't know if you know of her martial arts background, but this movie is set in Japan and she really is very handy with the sword and with the nunchuckers. <laughs> it got worse. We couldn't uh, guess as the Scarlet Witch, perhaps. Oh. That's harsh. But never mind, here is the official transcript of that press conference. All talk of witches and swords has been cut out. Spin of the week. And that's the show. Meet the presses next with Hugh Remington. I'm Andrew Bolt. I look forward to your company next week. Goodbye.